All right, everyone, give it up for Bree, for Laura, for Diana Flores. Uh, we have someone up next who needs no introduction. This woman for many years, and still is, the queen of Cannes. She spent a better part of her career building the advertising business at NBC Universal. So she's gotten to know all of the brands that have major impact on advertising. And then about a year ago today, she was named the CEO of X. And ever since she's been leading the charge on transformation of that platform, she's overseeing a bunch of new partnerships, particularly around sports. X will be doing a big partnership around the Olympics this year. So I wanna make sure you all know what X is doing around women's sports. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to X CEO, Linda Yaccarino. Linda, walk us through the opportunity for women's sports on X. Is it a priority of yours? Oh, my what goodness. What are you thinking about? We're just getting right to it now, aren't we? First of all, thanks for having me. Of course. Um, this may be the nicest place I've ever been to in my life, so I'm not leaving anytime soon. But thank you. Thank you so much for having me, and I love the first question. It's why we're here. Uh, you know, for... Am I echoing? Uh, if, yes. No. Um, so for, for many people know that the conversation around sport around the world lives on X simultaneously to the biggest events all over the world. The Euros are just happening here, the Olympics uh, that you mentioned, uh, and, and largely or historically, uh, it naturally came up that it was really the men's sports that were the focus. And, uh, oh, okay. So I'll have to use this story about almost three years ago. Actually, where's Carenti? Uh, Laura, Alexis Sohanian, and myself kicked off the first women's sports summit when I was in my old gig at NBCU. Uh, I, I think Alexis and Laura were prophetic in a way that there was a moment coming of how important it was, and I felt really uh, uh, encouraged and enthusiastic about the perch I sat on at the time that it was the time to get moving, right? So then I land in this new gig and what I find on the platform is, you know, the men's, the strong teams, the strong leagues, there's like big magnets to draw the audience and, and the women athletes on the platform, their fandom is just as ferocious. They, they, it is incredible enthusiasm, but the individual athletes themselves kind of have to have really broad shoulders and carry this, this um, obligation to bring their fans together and that's what X wants to do right, is to galvanize what's already authentically out there on the platform, bring those audiences together, you know, feed the user base, but also give the opportunity for brands in this moment. It's why yesterday we just announced a new series along with um, Alexis Ohanian's company that is going to a docu-series that is going to uh, really show users all around the world uh, the U.S. women's soccer team before they go into their season. Kind of like, if you think about it, they, they meet for two weeks prior to the season, they live together, they hardcore train, and they get ready. Kind of like uh, Real Housewives meets what it's like to be a professional female athlete today. So we're super excited. It's gonna drop in a couple of weeks. Not a coincidence, leading up to the enthusiasm for the Olympics. So that's just the first thing you're seeing about A, our interest, B, feeding the audiences that are authentically already on the platform, giving them what they want and taking advantage of all of our new video capabilities. So I know I'm, you see like I'm a little excited, um, uh, but it's something that we're really focused on at the company. In terms of the Olympics, you are partnering with your old stomping grounds at NBCU yeah. to do video around the Olympics. Is there a women's sports focus as a part of that? Well, I, I, is there a women's sports focus? When you think about just the chatter on the platform right now, 70% of the conversation going into the Olympics, and this is a U.S. number, is about the women and the women's teams going into the Olympics. 
right? So the, the anticipation, the estimation of how well the uh, women's Olympic team is going to perform you just could not be higher. So of course it's a focus. The focus is on the best in sport around the world coming together to compete. Uh, I think, and we all know when you combine that, that the Olympics breaks on the platform in real time is really why we have our partnership with NBC Universal, why we have our partnership with the IOC, Warner Brothers Discovery globally, because audiences globally around the world want to look at that uh, competition that happens. It's probably, it's one of the most pristine brands on earth, the Olympics, where the world comes together. So we're happy to be part of that real-time conversation. When you talk about sports living on X through video, are you having any conversations with leagues about rights on X, similar to how you're are having... Are you asking if we're making a bid for the NBA renegotiation? I can WNBA, confidently say you will not be reading about that. Um, but, you know, it's really interesting. The The... X sits kind of at the intersection of big moments all over the world. It's driven by sports, but where you can have this simultaneous conversation. So, so we are really, really aware of, of the role we play and how we enable that conversation, which is so important when you think about sports and fandom. Uh, and again, I said when you combine that with our uh, aggressive move as we become a video first platform, what you'll see is a very big uh, evolution from just kind of clips to shows like uh, we've done with our Boston Celtics docuseries. Oh, my God. Still two episodes le left. We know they won. But sit on the edge of your seat. There's a lot more to come. But you'll see more and more things like that. Are you in conversations with leagues? I know you work with the WNBA, but other leagues about doing docuseries on X? Sure. We, sure, have conver yeah. we have conversations with lots of people. And uh, the reason we have conversations with lots of people is actually is to feed the audience. And we're talking about sports right now. But I think it's really, really important because with the new company, we're barely 18 months old. I've just been at the company a year. I joined six months after acquisition. Uh, sports is the number one conversation on the platform. No surprise. That's the only reason I think Correnti invited me. So, so, but then what, what, what is really interesting, you know, kind of in, in most recent rank order, you have gaming, right? That makes sense, exploding on the platform. Then you have music, then you have food, then you have news, right? So people think that, that you know, they're surprised by that ranking. It may change a little bit with the um, consequential things that are going on all around the world uh, up until the end of the year. But that's why you're seeing a diversity of uh, content investments and announcements. I think we just uh, went live with a new show that we're doing with Swizz Beats and Timbaland. And you'll see that, which is a uh, new era of their show versus that became so popular. So we're super excited about that. That one is just about real-time culture dropping on the platform. And, and I remember talking about lots of conversations that I had with people when I, I first met with them, so captivated on their knowledge of how powerful the platform is to not only have culture break, but to drop product on the platform. So that's how this, uh, uh, this partnership was born with, with those guys. Let's talk about product. You have launched Grok AI, which is the large language model, your AI uh, product in Europe. What is the relationship between X and Grok AI? Because I know that X is leveraging, or Grok AI is leveraging X's data to train it. Is the idea that one day you will license X data to other platforms that want to use it for training? Why not do that right now? Grok's a newborn, right? And the goal for Grok is to become the best truth seeking AI assistant product that's out there. So so you're going to see, you know, Grok 3.0, Grok 4.0 coming out that will be quite differentiating to compete with the other uh, models that are out there. I think it's really important for everyone who who's listening to know the profound differentiation of Grok versus all the others. What is it? That is, it's obviously trained on all the publicly available information, right? And it continues to learn, but it's the singular uh, assistant that has up to the moment 
x data. So up to the moment, x activity, uh, uh, people's behaviors. So, so that is a profound differentiator. When do you get to the point where you license that out? That's lucrative. I think it depends. Uh, it really, we want to be the best there is. It's we're learning. Grok is learning. And that's what's most important for our company. It's most important for the world that when we achieve to be the most truth-seeking AI, then who knows what business models emerge from there. There was a conversation at the start here about athletes themselves, women athletes, carrying the burden of the branding on your platform because they don't have as much infrastructure in terms of the leagues that are or you know supporting them, fan clubs, whatever. How are you making X a safe community for them as creators? And I asked because a lot of people who are involved in women's sports are in the LGBTQ community. They care about progressive issues and there has been a narrative that X is not friendly to those communities. What would you say to that? Well, I would say that a large part of my job is sifting fact from fiction and uh, go past a salacious click. Uh, and I will tell you, uh, first of all, in terms of female athletes and, and creators, we actually consider that, you know, the female athletes are our creators because that's who uh, our audience, our users want to hear from and want to see so they're part of that community. We have a very, very generous program with our creators. It's why about a year ago when we started um, our creator program, there was probably, I don't know, uh, three or 4,000. There's probably 150,000 creators on the platform now and athletes are a part of that and they share, we share very generously in the revenues. I think with our creators, the most recent we've been talking about is sharing over $50 million of payments to them. But, but that's just a, a commercial opportunity. Important, particularly with female athletes that have to make a living and we want them to make a living on the platform. But I wanna go what's most important and that is platform safety, okay? So in the last year, and very, it's another point I pause on all the time, is uh, you know we're we're pretty pretty gr proud in the last year to roll out a suite of safety tools, and those safety tools is a big spectrum of capabilities that we now offer uh, our our advertisers and brands who come on the platform and also our creators who are on the platform. They did not exist prior to acquisition, right? So there's more user control but there's a maximum of advertiser and brand control. Can I, but I would push back on that in saying that, yes, those controls didn't exist, but the brand safety rules were different. So would you say that what you think is a better approach is less brand safety rules that restrict content and just more control? Well, I, I wouldn't say that. First of all, what I wanna really um, add is that we are completely transparent about all of our policies and we are completely transparent about all of our code. So you will see that it, our job is not to uh, control uh, the, the behavior of people who are posting, right? Our job is to protect the safety and health of the platform. Our job is not to decide the, the debate on any issue. Our job is to invite you onto the platform so you can participate freely and safely. That's like the baseline of all of our policies and there's probably more than 70 of those policies for user safety. And if you think about it in a kind of easy way to describe, when someone posts a message, right, with the way we talk about it is that uh, remain, restrict, remove, right? If it's against the law in any territory in which we operate, we remove. If it is a, um, benign post, it remains. It's the restrict part that, that is where these posts that you're talking about to make our creators, to make the users feel safe, is when we start to enforce what we would call freedom of speech, not reach. If you're saying something that's not against the law, if you're saying something that I might just disagree with and you say something, hello by the way, that you disagree with, that doesn't mean that it's our job to take it down. It means our job, if it is lawful but awful, 
don't give it any more oxygen or daylight. Get a, a note that pops up that says, this is going to get restricted. Over 33% of the time, most people who put those provocative posts decide, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that person who's posting that awful thing. So it gives you a little belief in humanity, right? And then it, it doesn't get shared, it doesn't get seen. There's a lot of people on the platform that I happen to disagree with their views, but it's not our job to not allow them to have their freedom of speech. It is our job to make it ha healthy place for you to come to, to learn a different point of view, but also to protect the most marginalized communities. I think it's uh, demonstrated by a couple things. Uh, first of all, I, I hope everyone uh, is aware of all the work X has done for the most vulnerable of our communities, and that's children, right? And, and uh, post-acquisition, there was work to do that we learned we needed to do. New priorities, very transparent. Uh, uh, supporting legislation all around the world to make sure that the, this, this cohort is protected and the bad actors are off the platform. And that goes with marginalized communities, uh, you know, all over the world. We have a lot of safety tools in place, a big priority for us that did not exist prior to acquisition. The message that I'm hearing from you is, you know, very clear in terms of where you stand in brand safety. Elon Musk is here in Cannes today. He had an interview with WPP. And for the first time, he had a more clear brand safety message than I've ever heard. He basically said, you know, we think advertisers having choice of where to put their messages is a form of free speech. Why is Elon coming to Cannes, delivering that message to marketers? Is that you saying, Elon, you got to get this brand safety stuff together? Do you think he's now a believer? Because, you know, a few months ago, he was basically saying, F you to the ad community. Now he's here, and it sounds like he's kind of turned a little bit. Well, you may uh, have said what Elon said a different way. Mm -hmm. I may say it a different way. But there was uh, a lot of, that was not an uh, uh, unprovoked reaction, right? There's a lot of things that go on. What I would talk about is looking to the future. Why is Elon here? A lot of the same reason that I'm here is to talk about uh, sit fact from fiction. There's all insatiable interest in our company insatiable interest uh, in Elon. It's my job to make sure that I talk about uh, the data-driven facts about all the progress that we've made. I don't know about you, but uh, sitting all day talking about brand safety, I'm happy to do that. We've hired uh, the best in the business from competitive platforms, the best in the business from holding companies to do that hard work for us. But what we really should be talking about, things like the shows that we're doing for the US Women's Soccer League. Talk about what we just announced with, um, with uh, Swizz Beats and Timbaland, right? Or talk about our Celtics show, that, that the first episode had 31 million views. The, the advancements that we've made in the product are so stunning. But what Elon was talking about this morning is letting us earn the opportunity to, to give you the ad products that deliver the return on the investment in the places you want to put your advertisement. It's pretty logical, and we have built all of those tools from a safety perspective and also from an ad product perspective to do that. And that's why we're here. In terms of the business, we only have a few minutes, so I want to make sure we discuss this. I, can you believe that? Can you believe it? It's just flying by, Linda. We'll like it never happened. In a minute. The, you said that you expect X to be profitable in 2024, but Elon said last year, oh, X will be profitable next month, or X will be profitable this month. Like, it sort of feels like the boy who cried wolf. How do you feel so sure that it's actually going to be profitable in 2024? There is so much momentum going on at the company. Uh, it's hard to bottle it in a minute and 54 seconds that's left. But when we talked about, you know, all the table stakes requirements that all of you in this room gave me, literally, day one on the job, here's your homework assignment, Linda. Here's your homework assignment. Build all this stuff. You never had it. We didn't like it that you never have it. Go build it. So we built it. But simultaneously to building that, the evolution of the platform to becoming the everything app was happening all underneath our noses that I don't think a lot of people were paying attention to. So the video product, now a video first, video for first platform, 
audio, video calling, Grok AI that is informing content recommendation, content moderation, right? And then you're gonna land, at least in the US, starting kicking off with payments by the end of the year. So when you look at that, the 2023, when you were first using those quotes, was a real uh, foundational year of change for the company. 2024 has been pretty damn transformational so far. And when you combine all those things, I think it's pretty safe to say that uh, the future is really bright for X. So in terms of the business, obviously, Twitter, before it was X, was a primarily an ad-driven business. You now are trying to become the everything app, so subscriptions and you know creators and licensing. Um, but I'm trying to size up like how big that really is. Like how many people subscribe to Twitter Blue? I think we you know talked about all the millions of people, particularly the ones standing in line, because uh, part of that gets. Grok opportunities with our premium and subscription services. So it is such a big growing part of our business along with our data licensing business. Think about how important the data from X is to many of our customers that we serve all over the world. And when you look at that and you look at the diversification of revenue potential at the company, particularly with things like payments, but you look at the even the diversification of revenue within the advertising vertical that we have, it is becoming a much more sophisticated business. So advertising will continue to grow. So many uh, brands ha have, been, have come back to the platform. It will continue to grow, but I think the balance between such a diversified uh, uh, business is going to then put advertising you know, still continue to grow, but the baseline percentage might change a little bit with all the new opportunities on the platform. Think about as consumers spend more of their life on the platform from the sheer and utter convenience of all the offerings that we have, then new opportunities um, from commerce to payments to financial transactions are around the corner. But how many people subscribe to Twitter Blue? I heard you. <laughs> so the answer is no response? The answer is to pay attention to everything that is going on the platform. Okay, we have just a few minutes. I want to get to something else, which is... Is this my water or is it... Uh, wait, is this mine or is that... Okay, no, keep going, keep going. Sorry. I just want to get to... I just want to talk a little bit about your relationship with Elon. Like, how do you guys communicate? What is it like? How often do you see each other? How often do you talk? What Do you talk through, like, XDMs? Like, what's that, what's that like? Okay. So first of all, when I first started at the company, I, I used to, people ask me, what's it like? And I used to say, it was the career opportunity of a lifetime, because a lot of people are very fixated. How long did you think about it? Career opportunity of a lifetime, that was the thought. So I kind of dropped that part, and I just say opportunity of a lifetime. There's uh, many days I go home and say to myself or my husband, I think I witnessed history today. And that's what it's like. That's why you're seeing the progress on the platform. Um, Elon's capacity for work is well documented. Uh, his availability to me still a year later is uh, somewhat still feels surreal. Availability meaning he, you can call him at any time and he's available? Yes. And Well, it, is he available at the moment he sees the you know, <laughs> video calling from X ringing? Uh, but, but, you know, we both have busy ses schedules. It's hard to be in the same city at the same time, but as we know the world we're living in today doesn't mean that you can't be in very close touch. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't be making the progress that we're making if there wasn't a sink there. And at Axios, we'd love to end all of our interviews with one fun thing. So, uh -oh. no, this is a good Am fun I thing. still fun? I You're still fun, Linda. Round of applause for Linda, who for still being fun. Um, the last time when you were here, I believe, was two years ago with NBC, correct? The last time you were at Cannes? Yep. How, what's it like coming to Cannes as the CEO of X versus when you were the CEO of NBC? Does the community treat you differently? Is it a more positive experience? How do you feel? I think it's becoming a much more positive experience. It has been uh, quite the stunning journey the first year. Uh, it was never more apparent to me than the day of our Senate hearings on child safety. And as weirdly as I tell people, I was excited to go in a way because I was proud of all the work that we had done with the new acquisition. But think about it, only woman, I'm not a founder, I'm not an engineer. 
and here I am showing up, and I didn't have the depth of tenure in the business. So, so when you talk about take that leap, it was uh, uh, unnerving. You had to pay attention to keeping your, you know, kind of confidence up. Uh, so it's a different experience. I think from the brand uh, uh, point of view, uh, you know, I talk about this a lot, like a very outsized reaction uh, from the industry post-acquisition. Uh, uh, but now we've done the work. Look where we are today. The momentum, the capabilities, the growth in the user base, the growth in every KPI uh, and new engagement metrics that I'd love to sit down and talk to all of you about is real, it's consistent, it will continue to be consistent. And also when you think about what's happening in a minute is the entree of our uh, video tab on the platform. Think about that as a central uh, aggregating, aggregator to, to uh, uh, really surprise and delight the consumer with so much video. But then the TV app is next. So uh, it's stunning the scope of the ambition and the pace of the innovation. So that's what's different. It's a growing business and I'm still very proud yeah. to partner with um, Comcast and NBC Universal. It just can certainly does hit different, uh, but but all quite exciting. Video tab in a minute, like when is that? I said a minute. Okay, so, so we'll see. Okay, but sometime in the next few weeks, few months? Soon. Soon. Oh my goodness, Lindy Eckerton, we just went through a lot. Let's review. So women, women fandom and enthusiasm is very, very big. In fact, 70% of the US conversation about sports is about women in sports on X, which is super interesting. The partnership around the Olympics will include a ton of coverage of female athletes. Um, you are really trying to position X as a video first platform. And so we're, we're, we're already there. That's why you're seeing the consumption, that's driving the growth and the consumption. Was I not supposed to jump in with your synopsis? You absolutely can. I did not mean that. You can absolutely I, I do it. I didn't mean that. Um, absolutely. Uh, you're thinking about clips before, and now we're talking about shows. You just inked a deal with Alexis Ohani and Mitch Kerr. You could post a four-hour, four episodes of a series or a four-hour documentary. That's the stunning innovation in less than 18 months. That's just one little tiny thing. Uh, but think about those video capabilities that were, okay, you used last time I was here. That was, I would be talking about the Olympics breaking on the platform with clips. There's just so much more happening on the platform and that's really feeding the user base. That's what they want. Video, it's many, many other things including payments, but we're, we're really feeding a, a, an incredibly vocal and lawyer user, uh, loyal user base and that's why we're doing what we're doing. I'm gonna continue. We got topics, sports, music, food, news and I don't, oh, ga sports, gaming, music, food, news. I would not have known that sports would be higher up there than oh, news. Yeah. In terms of, um, Grok, you called it a newborn. Uh, I asked about when you well, would. It's, it's um, about six, seven months in the US, brand new to the EU. So Grok's going global and we're super excited about it. So it's teething, <laughs> essentially. You got. It does, it can, Grok can be very funny. Grok is main task is to be ultimately factual more than anything, and it could get a little spicy sometimes. A little bit spicy, similar to Linda can get a little spicy sometimes. Uh, you have 150,000 creators up from three to 4,000 a year ago, which is a pretty big transition. 50 million. Check that baseline, but yes, the 150,000 is right. Let's just say it's a big growth. $50 million growth. Dollars, uh, paid out to these creators. In terms of brand safety, you know, we talked about how Elon is here and why he's here. You said that the idea really here is your job is not to control the content, it's really to just protect people. Well, it's really control the public debate. When there, it's not our job to decide it. We wanna have people come to the platform to operate safely and freely within the bounds of the law. We have, as I told you, uh, over 70 policies to protect that on the platform. And then on top of that, think about it in layers. Right, so on top of that brand safety layer, so you can have ultimate choice, the brands who are in the room, of where and how you want your ads to show up. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about one thing, give me a second, about community notes. Community notes, 
there's been some press about it today, some other platforms taking a shot at it. But community notes, think about it as a global collective intelligence that is a global worldwide fighter of misinformation, right? Uh, over 500,000 community noters around the world, 70 countries, any language that is posted on the platform, you can translate and see it. A stunning uh, uh, evolution of speed and accuracy that when you talk about other platforms, other platforms approaching us, talking to us now, maybe kind of, they, they say, um, flattery is the best, what is that phrase? That it, best form uh, of uh, yes. imitation. Yes. Imitation is um, the best form of flattery. So yeah, that. Uh, mm. but, but it's really important because of the uh, success and impact that Community Notes has had. And the beauty about Community Notes that adds uh, relevant context to a post where you're algorithm, algorithmically identified as posters who have historically felt on opposite sides of any particular, uh, any particular subject, but you feel the same way about this post, whether it's a video or whether it's a text post. But what's really important, when that post goes up, if you interacted with that post an hour before, a day prior, a week prior, we will notify you and let you know that this note has had added context. And Elon's posts have had community notes. Yes, he's gotten noted. Um, ads can get noted. Have you ever been noted? Not yet. <laughs> not yet. It's actually maybe like a little rite of passage. But the important thing to note, I'm glad you brought that up, is that no one in X can ever, ever generate a note, and no one at X can ever take down a note. And then, So it's really important, and our code is fully transparent, and you'll be able to see that, how it's designed to force out bias. But it's really important to note that the authenticity and success of community notes lies within the users themselves. Linda, We're really we proud of that. are out of time. So just the video tab in a minute. TV app is next. You think you, is, you tell your husband when you go home, I think I witness history every single day. And the biggest shift between last time you were here and now is it's become a much more positive experience. And you think about the confidence that is up. We are very grateful for your time here today. Linda Yaccarino, round of applause, CEO of X.